started. Uh, so welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, so just a few reminders that we are recording this. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so please be aware of that. And after the talk, we will have a, a Q and A at the end. So please be ready with your questions and post them in chat or have them ready to ask our distinguished speaker at the end. Uh, by the way, uh, so my name is Carlo Lapid. I am one of the staff at the core facility for bioinformatics here at the Philippine Genome Center. So the, the core facility for bioinformatics is a service and research institute that, that attempts to assist the local scientific community in biological and bioinformatics research, which can be quite a challenge because of the rapid pace in uh, the growth of technologies and the new, the new ideas in both computer science and in, in the biological sciences. So it can be uh, very challenging to, to keep up with everything, which is why it's such a great opportunity for us to have our speaker today. Uh, allow me to tell you all a little bit about him first. Uh, Dr. Palmes earned a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics at UP Visayas a master's degree in computer science at Ateneo de Manila, and a doctorate in engineering from Toyohashi, a university of technology in Japan. He has also served as technical staff at the Neuroinformatics Lab at Riken Brain Science Institute, as well as postdoctoral fellow in the National University of Singapore and the National Neuroscience Institute. His work has touched on diverse topics, such as context-aware reasoning, data mining models for activity recognition in smart home environments, detecting biomarkers for Parkinson's disease via image processing, and automated diagnosis of movement disorder. Today, he is a research scientist at the Dublin lab of IBM Research Europe, working in the similarly diverse fields of analytics, data mining, machine learning, reinforcement learning, automated decisions, and artificial intelligence. It's my pleasure to introduce to you all our distinguished speaker for this afternoon, here to talk about high-performance computing and data science workflow in Julia. Uh, let's all welcome Dr. Paulito Palmes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. So my presentation will be live. So uh, crossing finger that there will be no hiccups with the uh, with, uh, presentation. So I believe that you can see my screen now. Is that uh, okay? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Sir Paul, we can, we can see it. Okay, uh, by the way, you can please interrupt me anytime and then please uh, update me of the time because I might forget the time when I present some of the stuff here. So before anything else, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my sister, <laughs> Cynthia Palmis, because we were basically discussing a lot of things about COVID and because I, I did a lot, I do a lot of data analysis and um, very, uh, what they call this, uh, interested to know more about uh, this COVID stuff. And then she mentioned that maybe uh, I should uh, present something um, uh, related to data science. Um, uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the PGC organizers, Carlo, Francis, and Bax, and based on their brainstorming, I finally decided to have this outline below. So I will uh, try to uh, introduce uh, basic things about Julia. So we started with the uh, with, uh, idea that I'm going to present to some specialized group, but now um, it's more of a, a generic group. So I would like to, uh, ch I changed my presentation to much uh, like uh, overview in introductory uh, level. But uh, if there's more interest about Julia and especially on high performance computing and data science, we can come up with maybe another workshop which will deep dive on into the, into the uh, major uh, implementation and sample simulations of experiments and running uh, Julia in the cluster computer environment. So I will start with the introduction of Julia and then um, HPC in Julia. This is very basic thing. So it can um, cover those who have, who have a very basic understanding of uh, programming. And then, uh, and for those who, are, who have been doing data science or analysis of their data using R in Python, I, can, I will show also how to use Julia to call R in Python seamlessly 
and uh, of have your data set between R and Python processed by Julia and from Julia uh, passing the data to R and Python seamlessly. And then if we have enough time, I'd like to also make a use case, present a use case using uh, the, wor the workflow of uh, combining Julia, R and Python, uh, mostly Julia and R right now, uh, in order to show some kind of uh, uh, pattern analysis or trend analysis about the COVID data. So before anything else, uh, let's take a look of the development of programming languages from way, way back 1950s, where you have the first programming language called Fortran, which is really specifically uh, for the purpose of high performance computing. It is, uh, it was in the 1950s where when IBM was uh, very popular in mainframe computer, supercomputer, which was 17, 71 years ago. And then came Lisp, which is another programming language. By the way, I'm so very, very passionate about learning programming language because you know it's the same with language and culture in the culture, uh, different kind of language has different kind of paradigms or kind of construct. And some of these languages are very well fit to some problems since other languages are fit, well fit to the problem. So it's nice to have a good understanding of how which of the languages are for what purpose they are. And instead of reinventing the wheel, maybe some of the language, languages have already a very strong library, so you just have to use them. So most of these things that I've shown here, I, I, I learned. I, I'm very bad in human language, but for computer language, I it's my uh, basically my passion to, to basically understand and implement things. So Lisp is the, the next programming language. So the main strength of Lisp is, is that all the data in the code is considered as manipulable. So even your code can be manipulated by another code so that it can change. So basically you can have like a self-learning code. And that's the reason why Lisp is one of the uh, major programming language in artificial intelligence, uh, especially for rule-based kind of learning. So it has a lot of this, uh, uh, we call it metaprogramming or macro programming, where it treats all your codes in data as an expression. And it, it's like a data structure where it can change the data structure as it goes along. It's also very popular in uh, uh, theory improver. So you can have lots of these uh, rule-based systems and expert systems to do this. And then in the 1970s, you have this uh, C, programming, which I think is also very popular until now. So I would say that Fortran and C, which was a very long time ago programming language is still very popular in high performance, like Fortran, if you are into physics simulations, if you are into linear algebra, if you're doing a lot of matrices, uh, linear uh, 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 factorization and so on, Fortran is still the library that is being used by C and other languages for doing uh, linear algebra. Um, and then um, S, which is for data analysis, started from Bell Labs, and R, which is the open source uh, uh, package for S, which is they open source it and called it R. Yeah, the Bell Lab people are very, very efficient in their naming. So they started with C. Now with their statistical analysis, they call it uh, S. So it was 1976, and you'll notice that C and R is still popular nowadays. And then a guy from, who graduated from University of New Mexico used his PhD thesis to create MATLAB uh, based on uh, well, after his, he graduated. And MATLAB is also popular in, in uh, numerical programming. And then the C with, uh, uh, in the 19, I think 1980s, there's a change of paradigm from procedural programming into object-oriented programming. So you have this extension of C with objects called C++. And I think this is the start of, of commercialization of, of products because after object orientation, you will see a lot of uh, a GUI or graphical interfaces and most of the things now becomes easier because you have this object orientation uh, uh, programming that, uh, that adapts to this paradigm where Everything is an object, so you know graphics, call objects like mouse, um, uh, uh, files, and so on. And then for those bioinformatics people, I think they are very familiar. For those who started their early bioinformatics, uh, they they are using Perl, which is 
very optimized for regular expression. So any strings is particularly like the DNA string is well, um, very good, good fit for Perl because it's, it crunches a lot of this regular expression very well. And it has a very rich regular expression parser. And it was in the 1980s also. And then came after this Perl, a, a more higher, much more higher level language, which like uh, poetry, like Ruby, when you see the Ruby code, it's very high level, like you're just reading your code, like, like a typical paragraph. So it was, uh, uh, it's a pure object oriented program from uh, University of Chukoba, uh, Matsumoto, I think is the name of the guy from Japan. So you will see that mo a lot of these programming languages are coming from different countries and different universities. And then of course, Java came into the picture and it was like uh, several years ago that Java is the, is the de facto standard for industries. It was, it was founded by, it was uh, developed in Sun Microsystems, 1990s. It was 30 years ago. Java is an old programming language. And then come Python, which basically replaced Java as the de facto language for industry, including uh, data science. So it used to be R for doing a lot of this analysis and machine learning uh, and modeling. Now I think Python is number three in the index for the uh, popularity. But again, it was a language 30 years ago. So I emphasize 30 years ago because the kind of computer that you have 30 years ago is very, very basic or very, very uh, uh, relative to the, to the kind of uh, computers we have right now. The 30 years ago computer, I think has like 16 megabytes of ROM, one CPU that runs less than 100 megahertz. So the kind of language that you develop there is uh, usually developed based on the hardware that you have. And then in the 1990s, you have Lua. This is the first uh, example of, of a just-in-time compiler. I will discuss later the differences of these programming languages, which was in the 1990s. So um, 1991, two years after, it's still around 30 years ago, Lua came into the picture. And then Scala is a better Java, which was in the 1994. And I would say that there was a big gap with the development of a programming language, everybody was happy with the existing programming languages. And then came Rust in Julia, which started I think 2012. So Rust is specific uh, for performance and safety. So in Rust, the, the, the main focus is uh, sa memory safety. So when you try to program in Rust, the pro compiler, make sure that there's no uh, memory leaks in your code because a lot of these security issues is on the memory buffer. Somebody will, will uh, overload the memory and then the program will run them up and then they can uh, take over as root. And so the, the, the learning from this experience, now the compiler becomes smarter and make sure that even if the program is not smart, the compiler will, will tell him the program what to do. And then together with that smartness of the compiler is Julia. So it is designed for HPC. So very, very similar to Fortran. It is for scientific computing and it only started uh, eight years ago from MIT people. So um, let's see. So we have um, Fortran and then I think Python for usually for scientific computing and then Julia. And what are the, uh, the differences, the differences about, among these languages? So in programming, there's only three things that you have to take into consideration. So you have to load certain kind of data, which is the input, and then you do certain kind of functions that processes or manipulate this input and then output the result. So basically the machine is, is in binaries because they are in transistors level. So in order to interact with this machine, it is difficult to, to, to speak binary. So usually you have these higher level languages that will, that will translate this uh, language that you write or instruction that you write into the low level langu language, uh, into the low level that the machine can understand. So what are the different techniques to do that? So one group of programming languages are called interpreters. So basically you have a shell that you write certain commands and then the shell 
will evaluate and translate it into machine code. And then it will print the output and then it goes back to the loop of waiting for the command. So this is highly interactive like R, Python, and Perl. But the problem with this interactivity is that whenever you type command, the translation happens and then it goes back. So if you have a loop, if you have several statements in the loop, every time it loops back to these statements, there is a middle process of translation. And if you accumulate the translation process, if you have millions of lo loops, which is very typical in our uh, in data science or in, in big data, then that kind of interpretation and evaluation takes a lot of time. So you have that kind of uh, problem with, with, chef, with interpreters. Uh, and then for the compiler, it's a different thing because it looks at the entire program, translate the, the entire program into the machine code. And then when you run it, then there's no more in interpretation. It's just direct to the machine. But the only problem with compilers is that you don't have this interactivity. Either you finish the program and find out whether it works or not, and then you edit your program and then compile again. So for exploratory data analysis, uh, it's not very good. That's why uh, for a lot of, of, of the data scientists likes this interpreter kind of, of paradigm because you, you do something, you look at the data, and then you add more codes to uh, 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 instructions to deep dive on the data. And then uh, another technique for this uh, translation is the bytecode interpreter. So instead of going straight to the machine, they create a Java virtual machine, which is like a, a middle process to make sure that if you have a JVM and different hardwares, then all you have to do is just program in Java and then this other, this virtual machine will take care of the interpretation straight to the machine. Because of the of the what do you call this of the middle layer interpretation, it is way faster than than the interpreter, but not as fast as the compiler, which is in the machine level. And then you have the hybrid hybrid approach, which is the one that everybody wants to to do. Like you want to combine translation uh, interactivity, but at the same time compilation real time. So we call it. Uh, just in time, but translation. So you do still uh, interact with the REPL, which is the read, eval, print loop uh, shell. But every time you do commands, it's the, 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 the system looks the command and see, oh yeah, I have already a compiled image of that command, so I will just run it directly. So let me show you the different shell so that you will be familiar. So if I type Julia, this is the Julia shell. Can you see this fun? Is this okay? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Paul, we can see clearly. Yeah, so you can also start, for example, IPO Python for the interactive Python, which is another shell. And you can start R, which is another shell, right? So when I say one plus one, the interpreter basically reads this input, do the processing in the background, it's very fast and then gives you the output. It's the same in here. And it's the same with Julia. Everything looks the same, but and underneath Julia is, there's a lot of pre, uh, what do you call this uh, compilation thing, if especially in, in the function. But at this point in time, uh, they are very, very similar. So for example, uh, um, uh, you can do loops and so on, but I, I don't want to go into that detail. Let me go back first to the, to the upper level. So let me now show you a good uh, differentiation of the interpretation and the compilation process. So I have here Julia code, which is the sum of X, where X is a vector of values. So in, in math, you call it a sum, summation of Xi from I one to N, so you have your N data set. So let's start with random data, uh, 10 to the eighth. Oh, no, it's not running here. Okay. Come on. Okay, so now, fine. I think my, my keyboard is not working. Thank you for, <laughs> for making it work. Okay, so you see now the vector of values here. This is the one that we're gonna do. So this is a like, a like 100 million data set, uh, data. This is not, this is nothing for the computer. So it's, uh, it's nothing. So what we're gonna do is that we create a function in Julia 
we look look over uh, uh, over this v. This is the argument. This is a vector, and then we have an accumulator here with this s. And then this is the typical uh, uh, line to accumulate i, or which is the content of this value. So s equals s plus i. So the old value of s plus i, uh, and then uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, assign it to the new s, and then return the value. So let's time it. So this takes like, you will see here that 8% compilation time. So in this 0 0.3, 0 0.35 seconds, 8% of that is compilation. If I do it again, because now it is compiled, if I do again the same thing, you'll notice that the, there's no more allocation and bytes, it will just run. So even if I change this uh, thing, because I have the compiled image of the input, there will no more be compilation time. So you will see that there's no more like saying comp compilation code. So this is an example of, 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 of running uh, Julia typical function. Let's run in C. So it takes me 0.2 seconds in C. Notice that I'm using Julia interpret uh, Julia and I can call C and uh, create code in C and call it inside Julia. So I, I sandwich all the code in C using the string macro, the triple code. So anything inside here is straightforward C. I will not explain about C, but believe me, this is C. And then we compile it uh, and then call, uh, create a function wrapper from Julia. C call is a, a, a call to call external function C program that is compiled and run it. So we have now function. So let's time the function using the same data set. Okay, so it, it it's it's um, a little bit faster than 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 Julia, a little bit. So 0.2 versus 0.3 seconds. So both of them are compilers. So they run uh, compiled image. Let's now use R call to access or interface with R. So believe me again that this is a real R code. So basically, this is a function looks similar to, to Julia function. C is a compiler, lower level. It's much more noisy, but higher level language like R. So you have S and then you have a loop for uh, over all this data set in V, uh, accumulate them and return S. So let's define the function and run it. Okay, so it takes like, let's run it again, because I think there's a per compilation on top of, of everything. So it, it has like three second uh, runtime. You might say that I'm calling it from Julia. So maybe if I call it in R, it should be faster. No, it's, it's almost similar. So three, three seconds for this data set. What about Python? So I use the py call, which is the package to interface with Python. So again, py string is basically Python code inside. So I define a function called psum for Python, the same syntax. Of course, there's no, the indentation uh, in, in, in Python represents this uh, end, uh, open and uh, blocks of code. So again, you loop over and then return the value. And then let's time it. Okay, the first time that Julia does, it's pre-compiling this uh, because you're calling Julia behind it and then running the program. Is, is, uh, sorry, I believe it runs like 10 to 11 seconds. So this is slow, right? So both interpreters are slow. So this only happens if you're going to use uh, Python uh, language itself. But if you're using uh, libraries of Python, like NumPy, then that is a C compiled object code. So you, uh, if you run it, it's run as fast as C. So my Point here is that if you're going to start a program from scratch, like you're going to use the loops uh, statements in programming language, for the interpreter, don't use loops, use vector or, or libraries because loops are interpreted. So it will make your program very slow. But in compilers like Julia and C, we, uh, they love loops. So these loops are basically their bread and butter because they are compiled code. So you don't need to vectorize your operation. So let me show you a very, if you're in computer science, you will uh, like to know how Julia basically translate this into a, uh, uh, into a low level machine. So there's a, co a code native command. So if you have this function in Julia, 
you can basically extract what is the actual machine code uh, to generate this. I don't understand this also, so <laughs> don't worry. So this is the actual compiled code. You can also look at the uh, LLVM code, which is the, it's like the virtual machine similar to Java virtual machine, which is much higher level. So this is the lower level, uh, the Java machine and so on. So the beauty of this uh, thing in Julia, because they are focused in high performance computing, you can look at the low level interpretation of Julia and basically hack it or change it. Uh, if you're not happy with the way it does the, the compilation, you can basically create your own compilation routine to make it much, much faster. So everything in Julia is about speed. Okay, so let me now give you a brief history before we deep, deep, dive, deep dive with Julia. So Julia started uh, initially to, internally in, 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 in MIT with these people, Jeff Benzanson is the compiler guy. So he's the one really who do the, the low level compilation. Stefan also in, from MIT, Vural is the, I think the one in HPC. So he's the one who, uh, he initiated the idea of multiple dispatch. And, uh, and then Stefan right now is doing the package management uh, thing in Julia. But mo all of them are in the math group under Professor Ed Edelman, and they are doing a lot of uh, uh, linear algebra kind of uh, research. So they are more in high performance computing. So they announced it in 2012. So I started using Julia in 2012 also. So there was a long wait until 2018 with its, with its, uh, with it, became, it became stable and they announced it in London. So I was there. And right now, Julia runs in Windows, Mac OS, uh, Linux, and FreeBSD OS. And it runs in, the, in these machines, x86, X86 uh, ARM, including your, your iPhone and Android and Raspberry Pi, PowerPC, which is uh, hardware in IBM. So IBM actually helped in the porting of, uh, of Julia in, in PowerPC. So now the stable version has uh, basically covered uh, uh, many or most popular hardwares as well as uh, OS. And then the latest version is 1.62. And then the, the long-term support, because right now Julia has a Julia computing group. So these uh, guys created a consultation consulting company or a uh, company that, that helps other companies uh, um, run Julia if you want certain kind of services. But Julia is open source. Uh, it has now 29 million downloads, 203,000 GitHub stars, and around 6,000 packages. And recently, I think for the far, uh, last uh, few months, the number of packages is just exploding. So this is one of the highlight usually when people present in Julia, they show this benchmarks result. So you have here uh, several programming languages and these are the different, usually uh, HPC kind of problems like parsing, matrix, multiply, iterations, recursion, and so on. And you will see here C as the baseline, the lower is the, is the value, the better. So Julia is around here. So for all these problems, Lua JIT, which is a just type compiler, is also around here. Rust, almost similar because they are compilers. Go is, there are some problems like this one, which is not very efficient in Go. Fortran is almost similar and sometimes lower. And there are some problems that it's not efficient also. Java, because it is like the middle ground between compiler and interpreter. So you will see it's in the middle also. And then JavaScript is using certain kind of just-in-time compiler. It is uh, also here. And then the last uh, part here, these are all interpreters. So from, although MATLAB is, doing, MATLAB is doing some magical kind of pre-compilation, but it's still quite slow. So from here, Mathematica, the same, Python and R, and of course, Octane. So you will see, uh, but these are just for, uh, for programs that you write in their language, not using any libraries. Uh, that is the, the thing, because if you pick, uh, if you use other, uh, uh, their, li their libraries, which is typically written in C or Fortran or in C++, then their speed should be similar to C. Okay, so uh, here are the links. So for the Julia Lang uh, thing to download it, you can go julialang.org 
and you will see here the latest version and more information about Julia, like plotting and so on. And then you can follow also, uh, so this is the download page. So these are the different architecture that it supports. And then there's a long-term support if you want uh, Julia Computing to help you for the, if you're going to deploy things in years. So this is the long-term version. And then there, this is the upcoming release and then the nightly builds. And these are all the, the old uh, releases. And then um, Julia Computing, this is the, 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 the people who created Julia, they created a consulting group. And these are the, this is a nice uh, website also to look at some of the industries and the case studies that they've implemented Julia. So for example, uh, Julia is used in COVID. A lot of the companies who develop the, what I call this, the, the vaccine needs certain kind of modeling and differential equations and so on. So they use uh, Julia in, in certain part of their workflow. Also for insurance companies, for uh, mission space planning uh, in, uh, for, for research in space research, uh, toxicity, financial modeling, and so on. So I highly recommend you to visit the site and look at some of the use cases. And then um, this is the channel where everybody present their problem. So if you have questions about Julia, you have a lot of these uh, different topics like statistics, biology, optimization, visualization, machine learning, modeling. It's a quite busy area, uh, thing. And the, uh, I can assure you that if you have uh, a lot of uh, certain questions, they will immediately reply. And sometimes you will have a lot of uh, long threads of discussion. And if you say, you know, I ran something in, in R or Python, and Python is faster in Julia, then <laughs> you will just uh, open a lot of discussions because they're gonna find a way to, to, beat, uh, to beat the uh, Python in certain uh, workflow that, you're, that you have. And then um, for the YouTube channel, so all the Julia conference are, in, are, are, are recorded and available in the, sorry, in the Julia channel. So from the very beginning of, uh, of conference, of Julia conference, I think way back uh, 2000 something, um, even during the live conference, all the presentations are recorded. So even before the COVID happens, the, the, all the confer uh, Julia conference are recorded, which is very good because you can always get back to those talks and if you want to, to listen and look at the presentation. I'd like to announce that Julia conference is July 28th to 30. Uh, the registration is free, so you can follow this uh, thing. You can register. And there's a workshop also uh, a week before that, so it's also free. Uh, so kindly um, um, register if you're interested. And then uh, shameless plug, so I have a GitHub repo for all my works related to Julia. So you can cl uh, click this Julia workshop. I have, um, I have a binder. If you follow this, you will go to, this binder will create a virtual machine that allows you to run all the notebooks uh, uh, thing that I prepared here to learn Julia. And you can run this anywhere as long as you have uh, what they call this a connection of internet. So let me check, for example, what how uh, what is the the machine that they give you? So so this machine I don't know where it is, but if you look at the machine, it has uh, eight CPUs, which is not bad. And then for the memory, it gives you fifty one gig gigabytes of memory. That is quite very how do you call this, uh, generous. And for the size of the, of, the, of the hard disk, it's 981 gigabytes. So every time you click, uh, uh, every time you click and follow that link, you will have your own virtual machine and you can play uh, 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 with Julia in that machine. So you can run these notebooks that I have, um, it will, 
it will run there and then you can follow the 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 example there and then julia will run and then you can somehow uh add more cells and so on of course it's starting so it's uh, it's slow now now it's finished so by the way it is julia 1.5 it's a little bit old julia but i'm gonna update it to the later julia but there's not much difference between the later and julia so you can play this anytime so after i finish my presentation i highly recommend you if you are interested to know more so this there are a lot of uh topics here advanced usage this past and so on and there's also a topic for uh advanced uh for using python and r so these are all available online anytime um, binder is a very nice uh, website so if, if you're doing workshop you can create a binder and let people link to that workshop that you created and they have their own virtual machine that they can run uh, whatever experiment uh, experiments they want okay let me go back again to the to the okay so any before i proceed to the to deep dive julia any questions so far or any suggestion let me have my coffee uh yeah are there any questions from the audience okay i think i see some things uh q and a uh, Joseph Azanza is asking, Hi, Dr. Pames. I understand that Julia is faster than Python when it comes to execution of functions in base code, but given the vast library support of Python and R, especially on machine learning and deep learning, what is the advantage of using Julia now versus Python? That's a very good question. That's the reason why in, in many of my workflows, I use Julia and run Python or and are in the background. So for those packages that are already there, you don't have to reinvent. So right now, there's really no point to, uh, what do you call this, to move to Julia if your use case is ha has already existing uh, implementations in Python. But if you are a researcher like us, we usually develop our own algorithms from scratch. And you cannot use Python code to do that. Um, most likely you have to go C and develop your own stuff, but C is too low level uh, to do things. So usually you use a high level language. So if there are things that are not there in Python and R, I, I, I use Julia. But yeah, you don't have to use Julia if your use cases are, uh, are already available in R and Python. But of course, if you are going to combine certain kind of customized algorithms that you develop from scratch with the data, with the libraries in Python and R, you can do that because you can basically run R and Python underneath Julia. And I do encourage you to not only learn one language like Python, if you have time, know a lot of these computer programming languages because you don't know, you, you might need them uh, uh, in your use cases. Yeah, but of course, the final ultimate goal of Julia is that it is just eight years old. It cannot right now compete with the richness of libraries for a 30 year old language like, uh, like Python. And I would say 45 years old language like R. It's, it's simply, you cannot shortcut the process, but the idea of Julia is actually to do things as a one language because it is a compiler. When you develop, for example, a machine learning model in Julia, you can really see the Julia code. But for example, if you're going to look at NumPy implementation or if you are to look at the TensorFlow implementation in Python, it's not really written in Python, it's written in C or a compiler. So if you want to extend it or you want to learn something about it, Good luck to that because you're gonna deep dive in the C level. So now if you have the Julia, and then if you have a TensorFlow written in Julia from the onset, then it is already a high level language from the onset. So if you want to learn, for example, implementations of all the packages in Julia, even the lower level one, even the GPU programming, CUDA uh, libraries and so on, it's all written in Julia. So there's no, the, uh, there's a very small percentage of of C in, in the Julia code itself. So much of the code is written in Julia. Of course, it is a very ambitious uh, target that they have to have a one language instead of 
this two language kind of uh, problem where you do things in the higher level and if you're if you're getting a bottleneck you look you implement things in C and this is what our libraries and and Python libraries are they are mostly written in C like the data frame packet uh, uh, the pandas uh, or the numpy the SciPy and so on uh, libraries any other question yes uh, thank you um I think we have time for one more question before we proceed with your talk uh, Edgar Morata is asking in chat, uh, thank you for that comprehensive lecture, Dr. Pames. What will you recommend for a biologist slash molecular biologist in learning basics to coding languages and data science? Planning to do a PhD in bioinformatics. Well, I think that question uh, will be directed to you, Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> my, own, my own experiences have been varied. I've dabbled in in uh, Perl, in R, in C and C++, uh, Python. Um, my, my personal philosophy is whatever gets you learning programming and getting you to enjoy programming is the best place to start. Uh, Python has a reputation for having a friendly learning curve. And of course, as Dr. Pam has said, there are many uh, useful packages there. Actually, I had a related question. Eh. Um, what's the learning curve like with Julia? Because R and C, parang they have a reputation for being tricky to learn. Python has a reputation for being friendly. Where does Julia fall on that spectrum? Baka makatulong din to kay, kay Mr. Morata. <laughs> yeah, so if you look at the code that I've shown, um, if, um, no, where's the code? Yeah, so if you look at the code, you can judge by itself if it's uh, a clean code. Like here, this is Py, uh, Julia code. And if you look at Python, this is Python code. Very, very close, right? There's not much difference, <laughs> except for in Julia, we use uh, begin end, I think. So you have always, you have to end things if you have in a block of statement, but in Python, it is already implicit by, by having uh, uh, these tab spaces. Uh, yeah, R is quite messy. I think it's very close to C. So, but it's still almost similar. So I would say that, I would say that Python and Julia in terms of um, uh, the language, I think they're very, very close to each other. And by the way, Julia, if you know MATLAB, I think MATLAB is the closest to Julia. Okay, and thanks I, very much. That's very easy. I, sorry, I interrupted, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I would say that to me, a lot of the learning in, 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 in computer programming, just get a computer, just get a keyboard and get, uh, get your hand dirty because everything is, is, in the, is in your hand. So sometimes, most often, I, don't, I can't do anything, but the moment I place my hand in the keyboard, my, my, my hand has its own memory. So you cannot learn a language by just reading like a novel. You really have to, to, to do the dirty work by practicing in the keyboard and after a while, it's just like riding bicycle in programming. After a while, you don't even notice that you're riding a bicycle. In similar way, in programming, after a while, your hands will just flow. You know, it's like riding a bike also. But it takes time. There's no shortcut. They always say, spend 10,000 hours of work, and then you will become, people will say you are a genius at that particular thing. Yeah, of course, because your brain gets it. After a while, it says, oh, this is, seems to be a repetitive task, so I will make, push it back to the subconscious mind. So even if you sleep, we're gonna do this all the time so that when you wake up after a while, it's very, very automatic. Yeah, I do believe that. <laughs> yeah, thank I you very much. Proceed. Yes, that's a very, uh, yes, please proceed. And thank you very much for that response. <laughs> so I, um, let me check up the time. So I have like around 45 minutes. So yeah, let's proceed to the next one. So I will, uh, so if you look closely, I, this is my outline here. I, I wish that I, we can finish this and I'm so excited to actually uh, talk to you about the COVID data in the Philippines because maybe, I, but this is a disclaimer. I'm just a data science guy. I'm, I'm not a domain expert, so whatever, trend I show here, I will not do any kind of interpretation because it's a, 
you need a lot of this domain expertise and you have to know a lot of uh, factors behind it uh, in order to understand what's going on. But the, this is a nice use case because everybody is uh, affected by COVID. But yeah, so that's in the pipeline. So let's start with the idea of multiple dispatch. So in multiple dispatch, the idea is that the function in Julia is uh, dispatching based on the argument type that you pass. So for example here, when the first element and the second argument is an integer, dispatch this. So this, is, this can be any code or blocks of code. If this is a one-liner code, this usually this is the function uh, one-liner that we use. So f of x, y, dispatch this. So let me define that. And then if I have uh, my first argument as an integer and my second in, uh, and the second argument is, uh, is float, dispatch this. So x, y, yeah? So I have now two uh, functions. So, and then if I do integer, 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 I would expect that it will dispatch this, dispatches when X and Y are integers, right? Let me clear my, my output so that it's much uh, less noise. Okay, and then you can actually ask Julia, which function did you use in order to dispatch this uh, arg argument, for example? So it will tell you, yeah, I use this function where this is the function signature. And then if I do this, it dispatches when X is integer and Y is floats, it dispatches this. And then I can again ask to make sure what function did you use in order to do that? And if I pass float in float, I can ask, uh, that I'm using this. I think I ran this already, so something is not um, is not right in the sequence. So let me restart and clear uh, the output and write again. So crossing finger, hopefully. Uh, no, I should uh, I, I should uh, stop first, restart only, so that I can really do it line by line. Okay, so I think it's ready. So uh, it's loading for uh, the restarting the kernel. So let me see here what's going on. Okay, so now let's do again. Let's re reshoot. Uh, let me make it bigger so that it's easier to see. Run this, run this, run this. Uh, run this. Right now, the reason why I want to rerun re this because I don't have a definition of float and float. So if I do that, hmm, Julia should, should error out because no, you don't have that kind of definition. There's no float and float that you define. So I will not dispatch anything. In a typical interpreter language, uh, it does not dispatch on types. So you can even run here a string and then it will just run the function string. And the danger of that is that if your assumption is that you your function will only process data, that is values that are numerical, and then the function dispatches or still runs even if you pass string, that will be quite, uh, I don't know, messy in the long run because at a certain part of your code that should be number, it processes the string and then it will bump out. But here, even the entrance of the code is already this allowed by Julia because you don't follow the, the kind of data set that, that Julia expects. Okay, so let me create now a generic function then. Like if I do not say specific type, this part is this generic signature, okay? So now I have three methods. I have these two methods before. And now if I run this, because I have now like the catch all kind of thing, it will run because it dispatches now using this generic thing that I created, right? So that's basically the multiple dispatch in Julia. So multiple dispatch because it dispatches and the different signature arguments that you have, and it's very specific. So just imagine now when you have a function and you have a, a function that uh, for, for, for integers function for 
for floats, then the compiler can really run fast because it knows that the integer type, it can really create a memory specific to that integer type so that the size will be small enough. And integer arithmetic is more specialized than floating arithmetic. And then for strings also. So the reason why compilers are very fast is because their types, they are very strongly typed languages. The reason why you want type is that you want during the machine level kind of representation, you want the storage to be very efficient because if you're talking of big data, sorry, if your data is, is in a box where it can store integer floats or strings, of course, the smart way is to create a memory that is very large, right? And this is what uh, an interpreters like R and, and Python is doing because they don't know the data type that you're gonna use. I will, I will might as well create a box of memory that is that can hold any type of data. And that is quite inefficient in the long run. So you can uh, query, what are the methods now that, that F can dispatch? So I can dispatch with integers, I can dispatch with integer and float, and I can dispatch with generic X, Y. Here's an example of the multiple dispatch for plus. That is a lot of multiple dispatch, like it can process ordinal linear algebra. So the plus function in, in, in Julia can process different data types. Uh, there's a lot of them and so on. So Julia is big on operators because uh, you know uh, if you do a lot of these computations, you usually do a lot of these uh, operations. You can also restrict the type of dispatch. For example, like this is a this is a subset operator. Like I want my t here, which is a type, to be of real numbers. So you can restrict like a subset. If you are in mathematics, you know, like certain kind of subset. So you can implement that also. That ff is a function that only dispatches for real numbers. If you give me a string, I will not dispatch, but any real number will do. Like this like uh, integers and integers, like uh, uh, rational numbers. Let's say the rational numbers in Julia is uh, like this. Yeah, what happens however, is that if, if it is a real number, but one is integer, is integer, that is float, what will happen? No, it will not work because T here should be the same. So when this T here is integer, this should be an integer also. So if this is in float, this should be float. So this should be equal. So this is this certain kind of uh, restriction that you can implement. This is nice because if you're dealing with floating point numbers and floating point hyperparameters, then you can just say all X, Y, Z, blah, blah, are all real. And they should be of the same type. If I pass float, the other should be float. And then you can also, but if, in cases where you want a, a number, but in a different kind of subset, you can actually use T and S, where the first here element uh, argument is any subset of numbers, and here any subset of integers. So now you can do two, three, oh, sorry, let me define first. And then two, three, uh, any number. So 2.0 is a number, it's still okay, uh, but, if uh, this is any integer, but if it becomes a float, it will not be okay, right? So these are the kind of control that you have, that you want so that don't ever run this function if this kind of data type is not correct, because I will not deal with data type checking when I, I am inside the function because it's a lot of data checking and I don't want to do that. It will just make my function messy. And that is makes things also here in the in your function much much smaller because there's a lot of extra check already done before you enter the function. So a lot of assumption is already must be satisfied. I think this is an interesting topic. Do you have any question from the audience? Maybe uh, just actually, uh, yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, from Facebook Live. 
uh, they asked, have you ever used Julia in an environment manager like Conda? And would you recommend it? Yes, uh, actually there's a Conda.jl that, that install all the packages of Python. So if you, if you install pycall, the pycall that I've shown you, when you install it for the first time, Conda.jl will kick in and will install Python in the background and all those related packages. Yeah, so Conda is basically part of the pycall package. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question from the Q&A uh, chat. Uh, hello, Dr. Palmes. What do you recommend for individuals venturing in the architecture and construction industry? On which program learning system to use? Uh, yeah, that's a good know. question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think architecture uh, and things require a lot of computation also. When you build a bridge, there's a lot of differential equations. So, I would say Julia is a good fit for that. Like the differential equation library here, I highly recommend in this first talk. Sorry, I have already opened that. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, this one. Mm. If you follow this, there a lot of this differential equation is used in the drug discovery and creating COVID and so on. You have all these ordinary differential equations that you may need in order to compute your bridge. And there's a GPU support and so on. So this is a, one of the most highly uh, mature package in Julia, aside from the linear algebra, the differential equations. And they really use this a lot in, uh, uh, in a lot of problems that involves differential equations. Like for example, chemistry, biochemistry, uh, uh, the, the effect of drugs. Uh, uh, all of this uh, certain decay, certain kind of uh, diffusion and so on. It's all models of differential equation. So I would say, yeah, Julia will be very happy uh, to, uh, to, to, to solve your problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I, that's the questions you have for now. So you're welcome to proceed. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I like this uh, uh, piggyback because I can also somehow um, rest because the, the, I have the, I, there's a temptation for me to deep dive in a much more deeper, um, what do you call this, uh, discussion of, of the language. And then I don't want to go to that because I want this to be more higher level and at least uh, to whet your appetites. So one thing that also, if you're, if you're in uh, computer science, one thing that you usually do when before you, you, re, you really deep dive into doing things is to structure your data, you represent your data. You don't want X and Y to be, to be like, uh, you know, uh, not in a certain kind of, of uh, box or some kind of structure. So for example, you can think of, uh, uh, if you have a problem about geometry, for example, or points or distances among points, you can think of, okay, I will create a structure of points with two coordinates X and Y with T, as all real numbers. So that is a uh, parametric type. So you can have a point of real numbers, a point of integers, a point of rational numbers and so on. So if I do this kind of structure, this is what we call parametric types because the types can be a parameter. You pass uh, integer type or real type. In C++ or C, they call it, uh, in C++, they call it template programming. And if you are familiar with template programming and parametric programming, it's a very, very, you know, uh, challenging kind of programming. It's uh, especially in C, uh, in C++, uh, even in Java. So it's not very straightforward, but the, the beauty of template programming is that you can param parameterize your data, uh, your, the elements of your data, the types here, which is very, which provides you a lot of flex flexibility. So for now, I can create a origin point. Now it is a float because, uh, Julia has type inference. You are using 0, 0.0, which is a float. So it will now uh, assume that your origin or your variable is a floating point type. I can also create an uh, integer type like 0. 0.1, uh, 2, 4, and 3, 4. So you have now, of course, this one is not printed. The last element is only printed because that's the, the, the thing in, uh, what do you call this, in, in this REPL it only prints out the last uh, element in this multiple line. 
but um, uh, believe me, that point is also uh, executed. So now you can, after this uh, represent representation of your data, you can now create operators like, uh, I want to, to operate on two points and add them. So to add them, I have to access X and Y and add the elements X and Y. So now you can import the base Julia uh, 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 multiplication operator, for example. So let, let's, uh, let me rephrase this instead of addition. So the reason of importing is that I want to override the existing dispatches of times because right now there are already more than, I don't know how many dispatches of times already in, in Julia. So there's a lot of them. And now you created a new data structure called point. And right now, times does not dispatch on that particular data structure. So you want to extend that to your operation, right? So let me clear this. So I will now create a function called times with arguments A, which is a point and B as a point. And then I will return another structure, which is a point where the first element is the product of the elements X in A and elements X in B. And the second element, uh, the second uh, point is the product of the Y elements of A and Y elements of B. So it's basically like your typical mathematical operators, right? So once I have created that, now I can operate on my two points. So one times three is three, two times four is eight. Then that will be three, eight. Does that make sense? So with this simple example, you can think of a lot of these applications. You can wrap your data structure, whatever problems that you have, wrap it like this, and then create certain kind of operations like this and then operate on them. So from this level, actually you're now operating, you're creating your own basically system. You're creating your own grammar. You can create your own uh, algebra. You can create your own mathematics basic, basically based on your customized structure, whatever it is. So in this case, this is just a geometric structure, but you can think of many things. And that is the beauty of Julia. So the workflow usually is that you wrap your objects or your data into a certain kind of structure and then you define a series of, of operators. Julia is very, is very good in operators because it can do all these Greek symbols like epsilon or whatever. So you can, it's normal in Julia program, like it looks like a mathematical code because you can basically copy all those uh, gamma and so on in your, in your function definition. And then it will it will run, and when you read your code, it looks like a mathematical algorithm. Yeah, so that is, I would say, I think the most important thing that would differentiate Julia from the other uh, interpreters: the idea of types, the idea of multiple dispatch. Uh, and let me also now go to the okay to the idea of just-in-time compilation. So now I think I, I skipped something when I uh, talk about the dispatch, but anyway. So another, uh, what do you call this feature for high performance computing that Julia has is the compilation. So for example, I have a function here, X, which is, it's just square, whatever value you pass, right? Now, at this point in time, Julia did, does not do any compilation. This is like, I cannot do anything here because I don't have types. This is just a template. I cannot assign a memory space because X, I don't know what is it. What is it. But the moment I call the function and pass three, then Julia knows that, aha, so you, you want to process integers. So now I can create a specialized code specific to integer type so that when you run again another my the same function with a different value as long as the type is the same i will not change anything the code will be the same because the location memory location can store any kind of integers so let's do that so now from the perspective of interpreter it like it looks the same right but actually underneath it is is real compilation so if i ask julia what did you do in order to do that, 
first, I have to translate this into LLVM code to the lowered code. And then to the uh, first lowered code, LLVM code, and from LLVM code to the native code. These are all, you can look at all these processes of translation and if you're not happy, you can basically create your own translation. So that's the thing. What you will notice here, if I so, say LLVM code, is that it understands that I'm going to create an integer kind of native machine. So if you look at the native interpretation, this is the compiled code for integer, it will use this all the time. So even if I use, if I use a different kind of integer, it's the same uh, compilation. But if I change this to float, float requires a different kind of memory location. It's more uh, complex because it's a floating point and binary numbers does not easily represent uh, floating point numbers because of fractions. So the, what you call this, the compilation code will be different. So if you look that, it's much faster, it's much shorter, by the way, because of course, a lot of the uh, advances in hardware in computer is on floating point arithmetic. So basically Julia uh, finds it much easier <laughs> to process floating points because of this uh, support. So now you will see here, if I look at the LLV LLVM code now, it says now I created a specialized code for double. So whenever you call this function with double elements, I will just reuse this thing and they will not pre-compile anymore. So if you look at it from the perspective of a compiler, it's like it's doing a compilation and it's caching the compilation and checks whether it has already the image of the compiled code and then run it directly. So that's the, the, the work of sorry, of Julia in the background. It, it removes this, uh, what do you call this, this manual process if you are doing a compilation of compiling uh, by hand, hand, uh, hand compilation and then running it. Uh, it does this automatically. And by the way, this is uh, made possible because of LLVM, which is a new compiler um, uh, created by, uh, by Chris Lattner. He is originally from Apple, I think, and then went to Tesla. And now I think he is now in, uh, he went to Google, uh, work on uh, TensorFlow thing. He's also the inventor of Swift programming in, 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 uh, in Apple. Uh, Chris Lattner, they say disappeared for three years, did not do anything and then presented to, after two years presented to the board of Apple about the Swift and suddenly Apple decided to, to, to change the objective C, which is their bread and butter programming language into Swift. So if you have iPhone right now, it's running LLVM code also because it's using LLVM. Uh, Swift is, a, I think it's a just-in-time compiler also made possible by LLVM. So most of the compiler now is using LLVM and they used to be uh, running GCC, which is the GNU CC, but LLVM is so much more powerful because it it just uh, it does this just in time compilation, and this is uh, um, basically created by the th by uh, a product of the thesis of this guy. So there's a lot of output from the university with programming languages and compilers, and most of these uh, what do you call this of these outputs are done by one or two people. Yeah, so you will look at the languages you can assign also like Python is just one guy, Perl is one guy, Julia is maybe three guys, but C is also one guy and, um, and many others. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm drifting. I've already discussed this. I think I just uh, missed discussing the just-in-time compilation. So I've, I'm finished with, uh, with this topic. I'm going to go towards the distributed Thing, which is the HPC uh, thing that, 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 that's where basically Ju Julia really excels. And I think for those who are uh, crazy about optimization and parallel computation, you will love this. So I'm now in, oh, this is very close time now. So I have to, to make it fast. So anyway, 
so let me let me start with so I use the distributed package and then I will check if uh, how many processors I have because I uh, basically uh, have I think uh, um, let me see I have in my course. Yeah, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And most often these eight cores are lazy. Only one core is always used. So in Julia, you don't want to, to do that. You want to be efficient. So this statement check if I, I started with one and then if I have one and it's just a shortcut to, to also perform this. If it is not true here, this shortcut will not fire anymore because this is already false. So this is, if this is true, I will add more processors. And now after that, because I already did the, this experiment before, it is false already. And if I check the number of workers I have, I have uh, two to nine workers and uh, one of them is the main worker. So I have eight workers and one main, uh, let's say, uh, master, one master and eight workers. So the total number of processors I have is nine, okay? So in Julia, you can do the function remote call, which means that from my master, send this uh, random function to the third worker with this argument. So create a two by two matrix randomly to this uh, third worker. Let's do that. So the future here is a data structure that says that, I don't know if your function can, can run maybe very, very slow. So maybe the data is in the future. So they call it future because you, it is a background task and you, have, you may wait depending on the speed of that function call, how long it finished. And then you can fetch the result. So this is your, R is your reference to that future. So fetch the value of R and that is it. So you send something and then you get it back. Another function is the at here is the macro fu function. We call it macro because it's, uh, anyway, I will discuss, uh, it's, a, it's an advanced topic. So I just uh, assume that whenever you see at here, it is a, a special uh, macro function in Julia. So it says here at spawn at number two worker, this random function. The nice thing about the macro is that it's much clearer to use it than, than the remote call because you can, you can see that you can pass here the random function in itself and then here the ID or the worker. So it's the same thing. So you will see here the future is, the two here is the worker, the three here is the worker. And then I can fetch again. So basically that's the idea. You have several workers, you send some kind of work and then fetch the result later. You can also do remote call fetch, like this get index function is just get the value of S in the worker two in the row one, column one. By the way, Julia is one base uh, array operator. So it starts with one, not zero. This is a long discussion also because programming languages like Python is zero base, uh, C is zero base, but Julia is one base. Believe me, there's a lot of long discussion about the reason why it's one, one base. But anyway, you have to live with that. So this is, uh, again, an aside. So here, this is the value of uh, um, first row column row in S, which is a remote call also in worker two. And finally, if you just want to spawn to any worker, Julia will take care and find which worker is idle and send this function. So when you do that, you don't have to specify the, what worker will work. So it's uh, in, in this time, Julia says, oh, I five is free, so I will send it there. If you run it again, oh, six is free. You'll notice that it's doing a sequential thing because everybody's free. So it just follow the incremental uh, thing until it goes back to, to nine and then goes back to two again and then to three again, because the workers are from two to nine, because number one is the, much, the master. And then you can fetch, fetch it again. And then you can remote fetch again. Okay, so let's use that idea. 
to separate work from getting solutions. So I have, let's say, N, 10 kind of work. And then I will create an array of future that will, will collect the references. Let it, it's like the, the references to this remote work. And then loop over 10 workers spawn a, a function like squaring, but this can be a function that can run in hours or, or days. And then you assign it to, to randomly to any task or to any workers, and then push it to array ref so that it will record all this collection of references. Let's do that. So now if we run this, I have now an array of 10 futures. Each one of them, uh, worker one is working, worker five is working. Of course, I made it very simple command. So now I can map the fetch function to fetch every element of this future. So map fetch for every array. So I get one for one square, two square, four squares. So I get the result, right? So you know the drill that this can be a, diff, uh, a long running job. I just make it simple. And this long running job after a while will terminate gives you the return, uh, gives you the result, and then you can fetch the result, right? Then you can basically do a map reduce. Uh, another way to do the fetching is the broadcast. The dot operator here is uh, element by element broadcasting fetch function to each, ele each element of the vector. So this is a vector uh, element, a vector array here. This is a vector and you have a function which is one. And that means broadcast this function to all elements. Okay, you will see this a lot of this in uh, in Julia. You can like, for example, sign. I have elements one, two, three, four. Since this is a vector, sign is a scalar. I want to broadcast sign to each element. Okay, so this is very instead of map sign blah blah blah. This broadcast broadcast operation is very, I think, very uh, elegant and concise. Now you can do a lot of this idea of reduce, map and reduce. So you map a function and then reduce it to, to plus. So I get the result of this into array and then reduce this into sum of them. So that's the result. So now I can do like, I, I, spawn, the, uh, I spawn a function, I spawn a job here for i into n. This is what we call an array, uh, what we call comprehension. So anything here will loop over and then this will return a vector. And then the dot pipe here means that I want to broadcast fetch each element of this vector to, to fetch. And then what this re returns a vector and then sum them. So let me maybe uh, comment this out first so that you will see. So at spawn here, spawn a lot of job. And then I will fetch each one of them. So I have the result and then I sum them. So this is the pipe operation in Julia, by the way. So this is like post fix. And I like this in my data analysis because you can add filters and you can add functions and you can look and basically do step by step. What happens if I do this? And then I add additional layer, additional layer and additional layer. And this also uh, the kind of uh, thing that I do in my, uh, in my, what do you call this? In my, uh, uh, let me see, let me show you. This is also the kind of uh, thing that I do in my package. So here, if I show you my, my package, I do a lot of this uh, machine learning pipeline. So what you can see here, for example, is, is a pipeline of expression for doing, uh, what do you call this, uh, 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 machine learning. So you can uh, have a pipeline like this, like data, categorical features, have been encoded, the numerical features combined with the numerical features, and then uh, pipe this to the different learners, and then cross-validate them and pick the best learner among them. So this is, this is the kind of, of expression that you can do. So you can have an, a very, uh, what do you call this complex kind of uh, pre-processing layer in your pipeline where the data is processed in different ways like this. And then before you feed it to the final uh, learner. 
right? So that thing is, uh, I think uh, I, I uh, make use a lot of this uh, thing in my, in, my, uh, in my package because the analysis becomes straightforward. So let me go back again to my presentation. Yeah, I, it's indirectly also advertising my package. <laughs> Sorry for the shameless flag. So anyway, so now we can actually do a much, much, uh, what do you call this, elegant version of the distributed thing that does this spawning background thing in a, in a very concise way. So you can use app distributed. You can loop over 10 tasks. So the, for example, this is the task inside here is basically a, a series of, of operations. And then the last one is the value that you want to return for that thing. So just imagine that these uh, elements inside this loop is an anonymous function that will be assigned to a certain microprocessor or core or worker. And then they will do their own stuff. And then whatever they finish, they will return. And then this is the reduction part. So this is the map part. And then this is the reduction part. So let's see. So worker seven received I, which is eight. Worker six received task number seven and so on. And then it loops over and then sum, sum them. So you have 385, which is basically 385 here. So you can imagine what kind of tasks you want to do here. Like for example, uh, usually you do a lot of replica uh, uh, replications in your experiment. So you can think of this as trials. And then you have here uh, uh, cross-validation experiment or different seeds of your experiment and then return a certain kind of RMSE or a certain kind of value and then uh, reduce them into, into what I call this, into addition. Or you can concatenate them into vectors like this. So you have a you have a vector of values returned. And then from that vector, you can sum and you can collect them or reduce them into total. So after that collection, you can basically sum the result because your result now is, contains this uh, concatenation of, of, of the values that the, of these workers. So now I can say sum them, which is also goes back to the same result that we have. Any questions so far? Oh, I'm already beyond my presentation. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we have time for one question right now. Uh, somebody asked, um, hi, Dr. Palmes, will you recommend Julia for statistical treatment compared to other st statistical packages available? Does it have more syntax to use than the other programming languages or is it just the same? So I imagine this is requesting a comparison with things like R or, or S or or SPSS, yeah. Or, yeah. So far, uh, the statistic part of Julia is not yet, yet mature because uh, R is so so good, and most of the statistical people who are doing packages are in R. So most of the Julia developers are really machine learners, uh, high performance people. So the the statistics part is still not yet, I would say, mature, although. Again, as I have said, as a transition, you can always call R uh, in Julia. And I do this a lot of time because sometimes I, I miss a lot of, of uh, R uh, back packages. So I usually call R inside Julia. Yeah, that's a good question. And yeah, I think uh, in the future, I, ho I hope that more people will develop statistics packages in Julia. And by the way, Douglas Bates, I don't know, for R people, they know this. Douglas Bates is a popular figure in, in R because he has a lot, uh, I think, uh, the linear models and all some models there. He's the author. And he's now, uh, he, he is now developing in Julia, I think way, way like uh, three, five years ago. So Douglas Bates is a big uh, uh, adapter of Julia also. What, should, what shall we do? Should I continue? and maybe record this and then maybe for those people who are busy, they can drop off and then I just uh, finish my, my, my talk. Is that okay? 
uh, how much how much do you have left? I guess is the <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I don't want to impose too much on our attendees time. Kung kung matagal pa, uh, maybe you could uh, uh, maybe take a few more, maybe five to ten minutes to, okay. to close and parang I don't know summarize okay. or bring up anything else you'd like to to go that over good. and then and then we can close the yeah the webinar. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry that we really because I I want to discuss the COVID thing. There, I will skip the interfacing with Python and R because uh, I think you can learn. I I've already seen a little bit of this distributed arrays. I will skip, so I will go to the to the heart of the matter, which is the COVID thing. So I I load the data from this COVID uh, location. I load them, and this is the data set. So I, let me do this very fast. So I'm interested with the death and cases. So let me uh, let me skip here. So this is the this is the death and cases that I'm interested over Asia. So I will filter Asia. So I oh, because the the data is all worldwide. So usually when you do data analysis, it's better to 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 zoom into some some uh, to some part of the data set. So you can take a subset of this. You can also use R to do filtering. Uh, anyway, so basically the typical workflow in a data frame is that you filter rows and you filter columns. You try to make a smaller subset of it and then you can then do certain kind of uh, visualization. So I will take a, a very uh, quick look of the visualization. So this is the data set. I, I'm sorry, I cannot make this uh, much bigger than it is. So this is the data set. These are the records. Some of the data are not complete for some countries in Asia, but most of them are quite complete. Uh, the, the spike here in the March, May, and July, because it includes uh, 2021 and 2020. But here, we don't have the data set for the other after July. So the, the number of records is uh, like this. The distribution of your new cases is logarithmic. So there are uh, a lot of ca daily cases, few numbers of them, few, uh, but there are lots of them and so on. So let me now uh, look at the, the distribution or the, uh, the trend of, of cases and deaths in uh, particular location. So let me let me show you this. So I'll do this quick quickly. So let's look at the Philippines because I think everybody wants to see what's uh, happening in the Philippines. So let me sh uh, look at this figure. So this is our new cases. So from April to 2020 to somewhere in July 2021. So there's a big spike somewhere in April there. And the number of the spike is 15,000, uh, 12,000. And the number of deaths, the maximum is 400. And you will see here the uh, certain kind of pattern similar to, to the, to the case, uh, cases. The new death follows, but maybe 30 times less or 40 times less. That is uh, the pattern in the Philippines. If you look at uh, India, which is really terrible, we can look at India. So you have a maximum of 400,000 cases and maximum here of uh, death of around 8,000 or le less than 7,000 deaths. And here around 4,000 new deaths and 200,000 new cases. So around 60 times less, but it's still a huge number, right? But you will see the pattern. The spike, there's a spike, there's a spike here, there's a spike, but the scale is 60 times or 50 times lower, but it's still bad because these are deaths here. These are the positive cases. Okay, I did a summary of this plot. After this uh, visualization, you can create a, a summary of this plot. So you will notice here that I created a function, but inside the function, I used Jul, uh, R inside the function to create this plot. So I display the cases and death. So you can, this is an example of a workflow where you have Julia and then you embed 
certain R functionalities because R is very good in plotting also. Like the ggplot, I like ggplot. And plot the Philippines. Let's plot the Philippines. So this is the COVID plot in the Philippines. Let's compare it with the United Kingdom because the contrast here is that we have a lot of vaccination now happening in United Kingdom and Europe. So these are the cases. So there's a still a spike here, like almost 40,000. But you will see that because of vaccination, it's flat, right? So vaccination is good. <laughs> Israel is also almost 90% of the population is vaccinated. There's a spike here during February. And then there's not much spike here, 1,500. And yeah, after the vaccination, almost flat also. And then India, this is uh, the, the India you've, you've seen already. Uh, Thailand, let's go to Asia again. So it's going up, this is not good. And it's going up, this is not good. Uh, at least it's not yet that bad because less than 100 deaths, daily deaths. But yeah, it's still the death. But, so it's not really a nice way to look at. Vietnam is quite, it's quite good because although there's a rise, the number of deaths is like six or less. So I'm not sure whether this data collection is perfect or the, the case or, or the test that they're doing is good. Singapore is really good. Like cases is totally flat and death is like two, one, 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 one and nothing. They really control it. Malaysia, I think, is very similar to Philippines and Singapore uh, and, and Indonesia. So there's a rise of cases also, the trend, and rise of uh, death cases also, but less than or around 100 to 200 cases. So hopefully they can uh, flatten it or, or stop it. China is also flat, I think. Yeah, very flat. There's a small, I don't know, outlier here. This is terrible outlier because it makes things very flat. So maybe, I don't know what's the data collection here. Australia, for example, is flat also. So let me finish this. Russia, so that you have a trend of all the entire world, it's increasing also, although they have vaccination. Netherlands, um, 200 deaths, it's flat because as I've said, Europe is very, now in around 80% uh, or 70% vaccination. So this is a good example to show you that vaccination works. Brazil, you have a series of cases, but it's going down. That's the good news. United States, which suffered a lot in the January thing, now it's really, really low because of vaccination, I would say. And then Argentina, for example, in South America, is going down similar to Brazil. So let me add my, my uh, talk with what is the future of Julia? Yeah, so Julia blurs the line between ordinary users, developers, and data scientists because uh, it, it's easy to make a package in Julia and you, you can only, you, you don't have to write programs in C anymore for low level tasks. You can write everything in Julia. And it's much easier for reproducibility purposes because everybody just have to learn one language, even how low level is the requirement. And then increase the productivity in the brain cycle because of the just-in-time compilation and the interactivity, the development time is fast, the runtime is fast, which means that the exploratory time is fast because exploration is an iterative process. You cannot do further exploration if you are waiting um, uh, days or hours for the result of your initial uh, uh, exploration, and then promote reproduci reproducibility and documentation by employ employing easier workflow. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the over <laughs> time. That's that's fine. Thank you, thank you very much. It's really very appreciated. Now your talk was fascinating. Uh, I do have one final question uh, before we close. Yes, please. Uh, and I'm personally interested in the answer to this. Someone's request, Mark Castro from AIM is requesting, can we get copies of the notebooks? I imagine he's referring to the Jupyter notebooks you've been showing all along. Uh, I will upload notebook? this in my GitHub repo after this. So it's easy to look for my GitHub repo because among the siblings that I have, by the way, Cynthia is my 
the genome director is not doing coding. So I, I, I am the only one with GitHub repo. So, so you do <laughs> people miss GitHub, then Google is smart enough to say, yeah, uh, the Amal sibling is the one that is the coder. So you could just go here and then I will uh, create a repo, let's say, call it like genome workshop or something. And then I will upload the notebooks there. Okay, uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, before we close, a few quick words to all of our attendees. Uh, there is a feedback form uh, that we'd like you all to fill out, please. The, the form is linked in the chat. Uh, and I believe that's a requirement for you to receive a certificate of uh, participation. So we really kind, would kindly ask all of our attendees to take a few minutes to fill out that evaluation form. Uh, and finally, uh, in appreciation to the time you spent with us, uh, Dr. Palmes, we'd like, I'd like to invite someone very familiar to you, our uh, Executive Director, uh, Cynthia Saloma, to award a Certificate of Appreciation. Uh, let me also uh, share screen the, the, the certificate. And also, I ask uh, Dr. Saloma if you could please unmute so you could uh, award this. Yeah, please show the certificate. Uh, okay, one second. Okay, okay so um, everybody, uh, we have 76 participants. The Philippine Genome Center would like to thank you for your participation today. Uh, so this is a little bit of the hardcore type uh, uh, of lecture, for, uh, particularly for our bioinformatics people. So. In behalf of the Philippine Genome Center, we give the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Paulito Palmes for being our resource speaker during the webinar with the title, High Performance Computing and Data Science Workflow in Julia, given the 16th day of July, 2021, hosted by the Philippine Genome Center at Maria Rejedor Street, UP Diliman, Quezon City. So Paulette, thank you very much for sharing your valuable time with us. And this is our simple certificate of appreciation. <laughs> thank yes, you. This is my uh, first time to receive a certificate for my sister. <laughs> 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 By the way, I'd like to mention the painting at the back is an oblation. My brother oh. is doing cardiology. Oh. I'm doing computer science, and my sister is doing genetic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this always reminds me of, of the research that we're doing. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last word to everyone. We will be posting this video, the vid the video recording of this webinar, on our YouTube channel, so uh, so you can review it or recommend it to others as well. Uh, and with that, uh, once more, thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, and uh, we invite you all to have a good uh, weekend. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good evening, thank everyone. you. Paulit, do not forget to post in the GitHub. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone.